Okay. Put your put all your hands down. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Excellent. Wow, isn't that good? Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. Okay. We uh, have discovered what Romans is. We've looked at the identification of sender, Paul, with identification of recipients, the saints in Rome. We've looked at the um, greeting, which is grace. So today we want to look very quickly at the Thanksgiving prayer report, simply because if I go at this rate, then either the Lord's coming back or I'm going to be dead before we get anywhere near halfway through Romans. So we've got to get a, an acceleration, I think. So if you uh, have a look at Romans 1, verse 8 through to 17, this is typical of uh, not all first century occasional or situation specific letters, but many of them, and indeed uh, most of the New Testament uh occasional situation specific letters and in this instance romans so uh first paul says uh, in romans 1 8 first i thank my god through jesus christ for all of you and he uses the term for thank as eucharisto which is used throughout the uh, occasional situation letters that we have that uh, archaeologists have dug up and is most frequent in the New Testament, Eucharisto, to give thanks. I think we mentioned this before, that if you come from a mainline church, they will call what we call communion as the Eucharist. And it simply means you, EU is the Greek for good, and then Chariso is to say, so to say good things. So there's the uh, thank you. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith proclaimed throughout the world. Uh, for God, I serve in my spirit and answering the gospel is another EU type word, euangelion, uh, EU, good and angel message. So the gospel, euangelion, is literally good news, good announcement. So uh, the gospel of which uh, of his son, the gospel, uh, I serve with my spirit, the gospel of his son, it's my witness that without ceasing, I remember you always in my prayers. Pros Yukamai, here's the prayer. So he's welded them together, the thanks and the prayer. So I pray for you, asking that by God's will, I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. So here's one of the reasons, the situation specific or occasional reasons why he writes them. He's writing them an announcement of a pending visit says, for I am longing to see you so that I, uh, so verse 11 is where I want to zoom in for the moment. Uh, I am longing to see you so that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Spiritual gift there is the word spiritual, pneumatikos, pneuma. We get our uh, word pneumatic from, so air, breath, wind, um, spirit gift is charisma so it's a pneumatic cost um, uh, charisma now that's the word or that's the group of words that usual or very very uh, often occurring in 1 corinthians 12 through 14 where paul talks about what we call the spiritual gifts so if we limit them to nine in 1 corinthians 12 14 uh, there are nine spiritual gifts however Paul says that I want to uh, share with you some spiritual gift. And then in verse 12, he says, what I mean, depend on your English translation, what I mean, what I, what I intend, let me, let me spell it out for you, is so that we may mutually be encouraged by each other's faith, by yours and mine. So Paul considers, along with 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, the nine gifts there, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, healing, etc. He considers that mutually encouraged by each other's faith is equally a spiritual gift. So there's at least 10, nine in 1 Corinthians and one here. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, uh, he mentions in chapter 7, that there is the spiritual gift of marriage and the spiritual gift of celibacy. 
So there's another two we need to add. So that's 9, 10, 11, 12 so far. So um, obviously each of the lists that he gives are samples, not exhaustive. And so I hope you take heart from that today. So it means that whether you speak in tongues, prophesy, work miracles, whatever, that if you encourage someone else by your faith and somebody else encourages you by their faith, that that's equally a work of the Spirit. And so whether you have any of the nine in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 or 14, you certainly have the spiritual gift of encouraging one another with your faith. So let me encourage you to encourage. Okay. That went down like a lead balloon, didn't it? <laughs> so uh, I want you to know, verse 13, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. So that's his uh, uh, function in life. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he, as an apostle to the Gentiles, is going to write to the Romans and then visit them to uh, share the gospel with them as well. He says, because I am debtor to Greeks and barbarians, to Jews and Gentiles, etc. Everybody, every one of us has a us and them. So we Australians and the rest of the world. And everybody does that. Every group of people does that. Nothing wrong with that. And so Paul is just simply doing what everybody does. So he says, I am in debt to Greeks and to Babylonians. That's barbarians. So from a Greek point of view, if you don't read, if you don't speak Greek, then you babble. Uh, we Aussies, if you're not an Aussie, then you're not bad income. Uh, and then he goes on to say um, to Greeks and barbarians, both the wise and the foolish. Hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So that's his Thanksgiving prayer. Uh, almost. Because if you look at verse 16, you'll notice that he says for giving a reason why he wants to come to Rome and share the gospel with them. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now, thanks, Matt. If you can go to the uh, next slide, I think. Hope. Hope. Hope is. No, not there. Oh, yes, there it is. Oh, you, you're spot on, mate. So. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He would have every reason to be ashamed of the gospel in a sense because it's centered on Christ who was crucified. So from a Roman perspective, he's a criminal. From a Jewish perspective, Deuteronomy says, cursed of God is everyone hung on a tree, hung on a cross. And so he's got every reason to be ashamed of the gospel. And yet he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. So the scholars believe that this is not um, not that he's not ashamed, but it's what's called a litotes. And a litotes is to say something positive by saying the negative. And by saying it in the negative form, it emphasizes. So there's something I picked up off the internet. Uh, Tony Bird uh, describes a litotes very cleverly as I'm going to use not too few litotes at this point. In other words, he's going to use a lot of them. I really don't like using litotes because they are not bad, which means they're very good, etc. So that's what he means by litotes, and um, very clever. Okay, so um, that's I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He's very proud of it because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So this is another one of those uh, Aussies and everybody else or Romans and everybody else or whatever, uh, in this case, to the Greeks and also to everyone else. So the Jew first and also to the Greek, sorry. 
for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith to faith as it is written the one who is righteous will live by faith so that's his reason for coming to Rome that's his thanksgiving and prayer that's whatever else uh, we're talking about okay so that's the introduction to Romans uh, if you have any questions just jot them down and we'll uh, try and answer them at the towards the conclusion so he's not ashamed of the gospel he's very proud of it and that's why he wants to come to Rome and share the gospel with them which is a bit odd because uh, surely if he's writing to a bunch of Christians they've all heard the gospel and responded to it but obviously Paul knows that but for him the preaching of the gospel is more than that initial invitation to come to Christ it obviously includes more than that now are we in trouble oh okay <laughs> no worries so you can still hear me thumbs up great okay all right so um he's not uh, he wants to share the gospel now what it turns out of course is a large component of romans what he considers is the gospel is what we would call sanctification so the gospel is not just a one-off hit one-off event you hear jesus you respond that's it that's the gospel now let's go on with life as far as paul is concerned it uh, your conversion your getting saved is merely the beginning of the good news and so he will go on to explain the good news as inclusive of uh, what we would call sanctification and i'll have more to say about that of course uh, from now on so then we get into what really is the um uh, the romans proper the thing that differentiates the roman letter from other letters in the first century and in the new testament so he comes then to uh, verse 18 for why is he not ashamed of the gospel why is he eager to preach why is he eager to tell everybody about it verse 18 begins with a four which is an explanatory conjunction so he's giving an explanation as to why he's not a ashamed of the gospel he's very proud of it and he wants to come and share it with them and share it with the world for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth now if you compare verse 17 with verse 18 they are opposites so verse 17 for the righteousness of god verse 18 for the wrath of god so obviously righteousness is the opposite of wrath anger god's displeasure they both use the term apocalypto, revealed. Uh, apocalypto is the word that is translated in our last book of the New Testament as revelation. So revealed. Apocalypsis is a way of revealing what was otherwise not readily understood. So verse 17, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Uh, in verse 18 the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of people who hold down the truth in error now from that you uh, see these opposites and so it's almost as if well it has the characteristics of the first century what's called a thesis verse 17 and its antithesis verse 18 so the thesis what i want to prove as true etc 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 and one of the ways that you argue this in the first century is to show the antithesis in other words why the thesis is necessary is because the antithesis exists and so paul announces his thesis what romans is all about in verse 17 117 and then he immediately launches into the antithesis, which is going to prove why the thesis is necessary. 
And so you can see that the thesis is God's righteousness is revealed. And the reason that God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel is because, verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed. And so the thesis, the righteousness of God, will counter the wrath of God for those who respond in faith according to the thesis. So if that's correct, then we should see some development of the antithesis before we see the thesis. So if I can get Matt, could you flip through to slide 26, I think it is? Have you got a table there with Romans 1, 16, 17 on one? I think it's slide 26, but I may be wrong. Yeah, that one, I think. No, one below. Uh, the one in the blue, 26. Uh, sorry, 25. 20, there it is. There it is. So if you compare 1, 16, 17, which is the thesis, at Romans 3, 21, 22, it looks like he's picking up on the thesis again. So notice, I'm not ashamed of the gospel as the power of God for salvation of everyone who has faith, to the Jew first, to the Greek. Uh, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. That's Romans 1, 16, 17. In Romans 3, 21, 22, but... So now it's a contrast with what's gone before. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God. Now that's what he said in 1, 16, 17. The righteousness of God is attested to by the law and the prophets, which is a Jewish way of describing what we would call the Old Testament. The righteousness of God through faith. Notice verse 16, 17. Through faith to faith. In Jesus Christ, for all who believe, that's just the verb form of the word faith, for there is no distinction. So it looks like then 118 through to 320 is the antithesis, the proof of why the gospel, the thesis, why it's necessary. So Paul is proving that God is angry with the way uh, humans are but he's done something about it in the gospel. And so the gospel is everyone because everyone is on the receiving end of God's wrath when they don't respond in faith to Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to look into then in this first section is the what's called the antithesis, the 118 to 320 where Paul proves that all need the gospel because all are sinners. So 118 to 32. Oh, Matt's ahead of me. Great. Well done, mate. Let me go and find that slide now. <laughs> so what we may know, uh, sorry, uh, what he's proving then in 118 to 13, uh, 32 is that all need the gospel because all are of sin, all are in sin. So, this divides into three sections. Uh, 118 to 32 is proving that all Gentiles are under the wrath of God as sinners because what was clear, a clear demonstration of God, they've rejected uh, and gone their own way. And so you'll notice verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For, verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. How has God shown himself to the world? He has shown it uh, ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. Now, this is what we call, remember I mentioned uh, last time or the time before, apologetics. In apologetics, this is what we call the cosmological argument. The cosmological argument is the argument from effect back to cause. So for every effect, 
there must be an equal and adequate cause to that effect. Uh, this was made very popular in the 1800s by a man called William Paley. And he was walking through a field and found a watch had dropped into the, into the field. And so he picked it up and put it on and went back and wrote this great cosmological argument that reason from effect back to cause. And his argument was, if the watch requires a watchmaker, then the universe requires a universe maker. His argument was in his day, just imagine how much more uh, relevant it is today. He picked up a, an analog watch and said, this is a very sophisticated technical piece of apparatus that just couldn't have happened by itself. It needed a watchmaker. And the watchmaker had to be, in, in a sense, more intelligent, more clever than the effect to get the effect of the watch. So he said, in an argument that is used extensively in the Bible called the argument from the lesser to the greater, the Jewish term for that is vachomer, the Roman term is ad minora, the minor, ad majora, the major. And so all, all kinds of societies use this argument from the lesser to the greater. And so William Paley said, the lesser, the watch, requiring a watchmaker, the greater creation, the cosmos, the, the creation of God, requires something greater, and that is the creator or God. And that's the popularization of what's called the cosmological argument. Now, the cosmological argument goes right back to the Greeks, right back to Aristotle, Plato, but uh, William Paley is the one that made it famous for the English speaking world. So what Paul argues then in 118 to 32 is that God has given enough pointers to his existence in what we would call the natural creation to leave everybody without excuse for, for trying to seek after him. Now notice verse, nine, uh, verse 20. So Paul says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through things he has made so that they are without excuse. Now, notice the cosmological argument, great as it is, apologetics, great as it is, cosmological argument, teleological argument, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are great, but they are not saving. So you can believe in a creator from the cosmological argument, but unless you commit to him in a relationship, believing there's a creator is not sufficient. As James said, you say you believe in God, well, well done, the devils believe in God and tremble. But the difference is, is that they don't believe in God and put faith in him and follow up with a relationship. So apologetics is good, but it's not salvific. Apologetics doesn't save. Faith in Jesus Christ saves. But apologetics may lead you, hopefully, to making a decision to be in relationship with Jesus, to be restored to God and avoid his wrath. So that's very important. The apologetics is extremely important. And thank God we have some great apologists. But in the end, apolog apologetics is only a prelude to the presentation of the gospel. Now, notice what he says there. They are without excuse. Verse 21. For though they knew God from natural pointers to the existence of God, such as the cosmological argument, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him. They're not in relationship with him. But they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal human beings, birds, four-footed animals, reptiles, etc. 
So there is a uh, failure to use the pointers to the existence of God that is left evidence of himself uh, that we that his intention was people would follow those pointers to the existence of God and finally meet with a presentation of the gospel. Now for me, for example, that's that's a good illustration of that is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So the Ethiopian eunuch had somehow come across the pointers to the existence of God, but he is, and that's led him to the point of having an Old Testament copy of Isaiah. And he's going along in the chariot, if you remember, and Philip joins him, runs alongside of, and uh, says to the Ethiopian eunuch, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand it? And he said, no, how can I understand the gospel if it's not explained to me. And so Peter, uh, uh, Philip joined him in the chariot and explained it to him. And obviously the Ethiopian eunuch got saved because as they were passing some water, he said, well, what stops me from being baptized as the outward evidence of an inward change? Uh, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And Philip said, not, nothing, nothing, nothing stops you, let's do it now. And so he got baptized. Now, I think then what I would say is the natural pointers to the existence of God, apologetics, whatever, will be like a Ethiopian eunuch. God will always provide a Philip for an inquiring Ethiopian eunuch. Now, that Philip might be you. So somebody may have picked up some bits and pieces of the gospel, as we call it, or God and the uh, God of the Bible, and they're inquiring. And God, of course, in his great love and grace, responds by sending you, a Philip, along to explain the gospel to this person who has made the first steps towards it through the natural pointers to the existence of God. So we always need to be ready for that. Always be ready for anyone, this is 1 Peter, Anybody who asks of you, the hope that is within you, give them a apologia, a reasoned defense for why you believe what you believe. So that's what Romans 1, 18 to 23 is. Now, then we come to a very, oh, very hard section. In verse 24, 1, 24, Paul says, therefore, so a therefore is drawing inferen inferential outcomes of what he's just said. So because they've rejected the natural pointers to God, because they've not followed up on what God in his grace has given, therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, so he just unpacks it a bit further. God gave them up to degrading passions. Now, then we encounter one of the most uh, difficult sections of Romans, uh, and it has attracted enormous enormous flack from those who are not Christians because it looks like God is saying one of the evidences of the current wrath of God is he's giving over humanity wholesale to homosexuality. And of course, that's going to meet, particularly in our context in the Western world, Australia particularly, or, or not particularly, but included, is that this paints appears to paint same-sex lifestyle in a very negative uh, way attracting the judgment of god and of course that's not going to sit well with our current society so what i'm going to do if you want me to continue is i will unpack this section in romans um, from verse 26 to verse 32. But then we should never, ever 
build a doctrine. We should never, ever build a biblical position on a singular verse, or in this case, a singular passage. To build a biblical position on anything, you, read, you need to read the Bible on the thing you want to build a biblical position on. It's not a biblical position if it's a verse. It's not a biblical position if it's just Romans 1, 26 to 32. A biblical position is, I've read Genesis through to Revelation on everything to do with same-sex lifestyle, and now I've put the whole thing together and come up with a biblical position on same-sex lifestyle. So I'll get you to talk to Ted afterwards, and Ted can tell me whether you want me to continue. But next week, if you would like, I would like to address the issue of what is the biblical position on same-sex lifestyle by doing Genesis through to Revelation. Now, don't, don't get alarmed. Um, there's only about nine references from Genesis to Revelation about same-sex lifestyle. So I can do it in one session. But I need you to discuss with Ted whether that's what you want me to do. And let me tell you my outcomes. I adopt the position of welcoming, but not affirming. Welcoming, not promoting. In other words... Is it possible, is it possible David, to um, uh, go through those scriptures to... Go on. Sorry, let me... And today, sorry, is it possible to go through it today? Uh, if you've got enough time, I can. Um, well, you, you're going through it anyway, uh, verse by verse. Well, uh, what I'm going to do, of course, is go through the biblical stuff from Genesis to Revelation, which will take me probably another 30 40 minutes. All right, we'll, we'll do it next week. Yeah. next week well yeah have a talk to you guys and see whether that's what you want me to do because what we'd have to do is leave romans well i'll explain this now but leave romans aside and then go back to uh, essentially to uh, leviticus and then uh, 1 corinthians and 1 timothy um because if i do it'll romans, be, sorry? It'll be, uh, it's a very current topic of course so yeah um we'll, we'll uh talk to the guys and and maybe next week if we do okay well, let, let me just again outline or, or give you my conclusions um in 1 corinthians 6 9 which is one of the most important passages on same-sex lifestyle uh paul is quite in your face um such will not enter the kingdom of heaven liars thieves drunkards porn and naya, which is the umbrella term for sexual immorality. Um, and then he uses the two Greek words, asenokoitos um, uh, uh, and malakos, which are the two terms in the first century for the, uh, the, the one, the active partner in a homosexual act and the passive partner in a homosexual act. So he uses both of those terms. Uh, but then, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, 10 and 11, he says, and such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been made right with God. Now, that's why my position is welcoming. In other words, I can't say you're a bunch of dirty whatevers and I'm never going to have anything to do with you and our, our church doors are closed to you. If that were the case, how on earth could they get saved? In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 10 and 11. But what I think Paul is saying is we are welcoming, but we do not affirm, we do not promote. So my position would be you're welcome to come to our church. We'll treat you like every other human made in the image of God. Uh, we've all got our faults in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 onwards, a vice list as it's called. Paul says, none of these shall enter the kingdom of heaven, liars, gossips, thieves, drunkards, uh, those who are uh, promiscuous, heterosexuals, etc. So if you're going to outlaw 
homosexuals, you're basically going to outlaw everybody else in the world from hearing the gospel. So my, uh, my, my position would be welcoming, but I wouldn't put those people in positions of authority because authority, whether we like it or not, uh, promotes what is acceptable in the church. And so if you have a drunkard in uh, eldership or pastor of a church, then essentially what you're doing is promoting that drunkenness is an acceptable Christian behaviour. So if you're happy with that outcome, that's what I'm leading to, then I will give you the data leading up to that from Genesis to Revelation next week. Okay, is that okay? Good. All right, let's go back to Romans then. Romans 1, uh, verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural intercourse. And in the same way, also men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men, receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Now, I know there's huge debates here, but notice, for this reason God gave them up, has to be a negative. To degrading passions. Passions is, you can have good passions. You need to be passionate about the gospel. But here it's degrading passions. Degrading is the term that's used extensively in the Bible, but always negative. So it's uh, negative, degrading, uh, dishonoring passions. And then he unpacks that. The women exchange natural intercourse for unnatural. Now, the word intercourse there is the word that we use for sexual penetration, intercourse. There is a huge argument about the word natural. I'll come back to that in a moment. But... Uh, intercourse and it's within the context in Romans of negative so whatever uh, we argue about natural uh, the context is negative so God gave them over is negative to degrading is negative the women exchange natural intercourse for unnatural and in the same way also the men giving up natural there's the word again the word is fusikos fusis which I'll come back to in a moment uh, they gave up natural intercourse with women and were consumed with passion. Consumed, passion is, is a, a, a neutral word, but when it's uh, consumed with passion, it's always negative in the New Testament. They were consumed with passion for one another. The one another there is alanon in the masculine. So it's consumed with passion, male for male. Men committed shameless acts. Now that's negative with men and received in their own persons the due penalty, negative, for their error, negative. So I think you can see, no matter how we argue about a particular word, the context is negative. Now, you know, almost never is meaning in a single word. Meaning it doesn't, you don't communicate a meaning, you don't communicate a complete unit of thought in a word. If I said fire, that communicates. If I said help, that communicates. But you start running out a single word communicative, communicative units pretty quickly. Language doesn't work that way. You have to have more than one word to generally communicate a thought. And so the context here is negative. Let me go back to phusis, natural. Phusis can mean the way things are created. It can also mean what we would call social convention. That's what that's that's our that's our habit around here. That's the way we that's the way we dress around here. We like our budgie smugglers. That's just natural. That's just social convention. Now, Paul uses phusis 
as natural convention in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when he talks about head covering. And he says, does not nature, Thusis, teach you that it is a shame for a man to have long hair and a woman to have short hair? Now, Thusis there cannot mean the way things were created because the only way a man has short hair is with scissors or when he gets old like me. God doesn't create men with short hair. Although he does when they're first born, but as they grow, if they don't cut it, it gets long. So Paul uses phusis, phusikos, the variations, phusis is the noun, phusikos, the adjective, and so on. The New Testament uses phusis in the sense of uh, social convention and as you can see, the gay lobbyists argue that that's what Paul is meaning in Romans 1. So he's saying Paul is against the social convention of the day. But obviously social conventions change over time. And so today our social convention is gay accepting. And therefore Romans 1, 26 to 32 does not apply the same way today as it applied in Paul's day. The only problem with that is, is that social convention in the first century was not against gay lifestyles. Twelve of the four, first 14 emperors were all gay. Some of the greatest characters in Roman history, Greco-Roman history, were gay. Some of the gods in Greek mythology were gay. So it's not against social convention. True, it's not the social norm, but in the first century, it was not against social convention to be same-sex uh, lifestyle. In fact, Nero married uh, several times. Twice he married a male. So it's not against social, no, not by any means stretch of the imagination can you say Nero was typical. He was an idiot. He was completely insane. But nonetheless, not only did he marry two men, but he married his horse. So you, you can see the kind of fellow he was. So for me, the context of Romans 1 that we've just read, uh, 26, 27, is uh, buying by in large is very negative the words as i said god gave them up negative degrading passions negative uh, uh, consumed with passion negative shameless acts negative men receiving in their own persons the due penalty negative of their error negative so I think in this case, phusis, phusikos, does not mean social convention because social convention is not against gay style, gay lifestyle. But I think it does mean what it normally means as that's the way God created. So read it that way. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural, the way God created intercourse for unnatural the way God did not create us for intercourse. And in the same way, also men giving up natural, the way God created intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another, the way God did, not the way God created. Men committed shameless acts with men receiving in their own person the due penalty of their error. So this is the only place where Paul does not use the technical terms for homosexual, us and akoitos or malakos. But you don't have to use the technical term to get the meaning of that's what he's about. He's given it in, he's described it without using the technical terms. And I think what Paul is saying here is not that AIDS was God's due penalty for their gay lifestyle, but what the gay lobby today are arguing is final freedom final let us be the way that we're created etc is actually evidence not of freedom and 
great rejoicing, but actually an expression of God's anger against sin. Now, that's why you can see I get into trouble when I do this. If you still want me to do it next week, you just get more, that's all. Verse 28, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God, God gave them up to debased minds, negative, and to things that should not be done, negative. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetous, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's decrees that those who practice such things deserve to die, negative, yet they not only do them, they even applaud others who practice them. Now, this is typical of the stuff that I'll do next week if you want me to, and that is that if you want to zero in on same-sex lifestyle as being the unforgivable sin, that's why we can't have anything to do with the gay, with anybody who's gay, or we can't ever let them into our church, then that's only one component of what is here called the vice list. And so if you're going to outlaw uh, homosexuals from your church, then you need to also, to be consistent, outlaw anybody who is filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetous, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, because they're all in the same vice list. One of the things I have a problem with with our fundamentalist Christianity is they zero in on one sin and make it the unforgivable sin. And then we use a very clever psychological technique called displacement. We highlight the sin of which we're not guilty to hide the sins of which we are guilty. And I think we play games. I play games with myself. I play games with myself. I love to highlight homosexuals because that's a sin I'm not guilty of. But the fact of the matter is um, I'm envious. I gossip. So no one escapes, which is part of the antithesis. He's trying to prove that the reason that the gospel is universal, it's a universal need, is because there's a universal problem that the universal gospel can fix. That is the only way to come out of being under the judgment of God, under the wrath of God, is to come under the righteousness of God, which is given in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's a heavy duty section of Romans, probably more than you can bear this morning. So how about if I stop, uh, Matt, is it possible to take any questions or will we just leave it there? It's very good. Thank you, David, for, for today. And um, I'll talk to the guys, but maybe uh, there are some questions. Good to see you, Matt Laylor. Yep. Have you got any questions, Matt? Any comments? Uh, no, no. I don't. I'm in agreement. Um, yeah, this is good. It's good. Well, that makes you and me right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to be in agreement with his words, so... Yeah. you got any... Uh, Gays in your church, Matt? Not overtly. <laughs> we we uh, we have a slogan: love, forgiveness, and acceptance. Beautiful. Yeah, I like so that we, it says. Yeah, go on. I like that it says, "Such were some of you." Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in 1 Corinthians there. Yep. Yeah. And 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy, which are the primary passages, uh, gay, gay lifestyle is part of the vice list. And so if you reject anybody 
who is homosexual, then you basically, if you're consistent as a Christian, read the Bible, you know, the totality of the context, then you'd have to reject almost everybody from coming to your church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for example, in 1 Timothy's brilliant, he ends his voice list by saying, and those who do not hold to sound doctrine. That's one of his voice lists. So right in the middle of, you know, gossip, sleeves, uh, drunkards, homosexuals, what are, what are, what are, those who hold to false doctrine. So, you know, uh, if you're going to reject um, gay lifestyle, then you better reject those who have false doctrine. Mm. You have to reject yeah. me for a start. <laughs> I've got to have a false. One of my great heroes is uh, Tom Wright, Bishop Tom Wright, and um, probably one of the greatest New Testament scholars still alive, only just. But um, he has this brilliant saying. He says, one third of what I teach is wrong. The problem is I don't know which one third. <laughs> yeah. And so I would argue, Tom, but a difference, two thirds of what I teach is wrong. I just don't know which two thirds it is. Yeah. So, you know, I thought I was wrong once. I don't know whether Tim, uh, whether Ted, no, I don't think you, Alan Davies wasn't in Bible college when you were there, was he, Ted? Yeah, he, he came. He wasn't in one of the lectures? No, he wasn't, I don't think. He had this sign on his desk, which I've never forgotten, and he says, I thought I was wrong once, but I was mistaken. I've got to go Good. and get one of those. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, the, the challenge that I have is constantly people who, uh, as Matt quoted from Corinthians, this is what I was. Yes. But they, they've become followers of Jesus Christ. Yes. But they're still still uh, struggling with what they were. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the challenge is, is, to, is to help people in who we are now. Yes. Come on. Yeah. Well, of course, um, Paul, Paul will deal with this extensively in 6, 7 and 8. I, I keep promising, don't I? But... You know, I'm hoping the rapture is going to occur before we get to six, seven, and eight. But anyway, if, <laughs> if it doesn't, we, there may be some people that don't believe in the rapture. <laughs> <laughs> Which well, I'm, I'm enraptured by that. I mean, I, I think. <laughs> um, I, I'm just going to say, to for these people to see who they are, yeah, in Christ, yeah. yeah. But yet we read these passages and people, like you said there, David, you identified and um, and I know what you're doing. You're saying, you know, I have these things in my life and they're ongoing. Yeah. But people still want to hang uh, around there. And there, there, there are Christians and we all gossip. At, from time to time, yeah. But the, it's it, it's important, as you said, that we we know who we are now. Yep. And operate out of that knowing, even though we still do those things. Correct. Yep. We still uh, are envious, as you said. There's yep. still arrogance. There's boastfulness. There's yep. as the list goes on. We're saying. And he sees us this way, but there's that word sanctification, I guess, where it comes in there. Yes. Ongoing work, working out yes. of salvation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. I like what he says there. Um, Matt brought it up about 11, but he says, Such were some of you, but you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and then people, we don't get that. If if we got if we got that verse and other verses like that, we would we wouldn't be talk like TED talks about you know people still 
living how they were before you know i can't give this up you know whatever it's yeah if you if you actually read read the word read the scriptures you would you would realize and allow holy spirit to speak to you and listen to you yeah you wouldn't know where this stuff would you david Matt? sorry say that again you wouldn't struggle you wouldn't struggle with this stuff to the degree anywhere that you do you yeah would, you're not resting in, in, in the peace of God's word here, you know, what he's saying. Yeah. Well, God granting that I don't die before or the Lord comes again when we get to 6, 7 and 8, uh, where Paul unpacks it, I'll try and unpack what he unpacks. <laughs> yeah. If you I ain't getting out of here that easy. But there's no rapture coming, so you're not getting yeah. out of it, man. You're going to have to go through it. <laughs> I'm 73, mate. I haven't got... Yeah, anyway. All right. <laughs> You're only three years older than me. <laughs> so thank you for thank you for being so attentive and accepting today. I appreciate that. And um you'll you know where I stand. So if Ted comes back to me and says, uh, go ahead, you know what you're in for. And if he says we're a bit hesitant at the moment, that's fine. That's fine. Um I've done this, I've done this. I, the New Zealand Assemblies of God got me to tour both islands for a fortnight with a meeting every night of the week talking to their district pastors about this. And so the Assemblies of God New Zealand, right? And so almost almost in every instance, there was at least one or two pastors that were not happy with what I was saying. So I'm, I'm quite... I'm quite prepared for if you want to leave it at the moment, that's fine. If not, well, we'll we'll see what happens. It's all right, David. We're not walking. We haven't gone broke, so we're all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate. It. Hey, Matt. Yeah. Could you pray for us, please? Yeah. Sure. Father, I thank you so much that when. We don't have to be under your wrath anymore. Yes, Lord. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Lord. Thank you. Thank you that in Christ we are the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. We're so grateful that you took us and placed us in Christ in the heavenly places. Yes. We are so grateful. We thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your spirit that leads us into all truth. Good Lord. We thank you for the gift of God with David Parker, to be able to speak from your word and just with sincerity and honesty and grace go through it with us. And, Lord, help help us hear your word. And I pray that we would become doers of your word as we hear it, not just hearers only. Amen. We glorify you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless you, Matt. Thank you. Bless you too. Thank you, David. See you next Bye. week. See you later. See, See you next week. Okay. Bye. -bye.